All right, it's officially 12.02, so I'm going to get this started. And anyone who joins late is going to miss this phenomenal introduction. So first, it's, uh, it's wonderful to all be together. Happy Wednesday, everyone. My name is Kenan Kincaid. I'm the COO of Odgers Parents in the U.S. Um, Odgers, if you do not know us, we are uh, one of the largest executive search firms outside of the U.S. and a real challenger brand here inside the U.S. market. We're about 11 years old. Um, inside the United States, and I'm honored and privileged to be able to be a part of this growth story here. Um, well, let's jump in. Globalization, deglobalization, data, uh, couldn't be bigger subjects that we're gonna attempt to weave together and to tackle here in the next 45 minutes or an hour. Uh, when Hunt Scanlon invited us to, uh, to discuss this topic, we tried to you know, think who was the right panel, the right group to, to come together to tackle what is really a weighty and in some ways kind of controversial subject matter. Uh, so let me just back up before we jump in. When we say deglobalization, uh, this this talk, this time is not about whether globalization is 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 done with or uh, whether the, the the world has turned a page for the better or for the worse. What we really are looking at is the world has changed over the last few years, in particular. COVID was a catalyst to changes that were already underway pre-pandemic, and what we have uh, around us is a is a more fractured world. We have geopolitics at play every day. We have wars on different fronts, uh, some that have ended and others that have begun. We see governments making policies that are impacting the decisions of companies. And, and we see uh, countries that were once really on the rise, maybe finding uh, their sun setting a little earlier than, than it had before. But all these have significant impacts on the world of work, on the corporations that are trying to create opportunity for for, for those around us. So we really want to kind of stare into is, is what do these shifts mean? And more importantly, um, what, what do we do about them? How can we advise our clients and help them navigate these, these different and in some ways unsettled waters? I think everyone on this uh, panel believes that in times of, of crisis or uncertainty, there's also great opportunity. So I think we're really coming at this from an opportunity-laced view as we think about shifting uh, um, events globally and also data. So again, we really want to kind of come at this from not are we finding consensus around what's happening in the world around us, but an understanding that things are changing. They are impacting the decisions of leaders and our job as human capital professionals is to, is to be there to help them um, make, make better decisions going forward. This panel here is comprised of phenomenal experts, friends, and colleagues. Uh, quick introduction on myself. I am a, a diplomat by background and training who now is, is an executive of an executive search human capital uh, firm. And I have a unique kind of worldview as we think about world events and now our place in it. Cameron Ireland, who I'm really proud to have on this panel, is with us from the UK. So it's almost dinner time where he's at. Thank you, Cameron. Cameron uh, was the co-founder and CEO until here recently of BoardX. I imagine many of the folks on this call uh, has uh, BoardX as a, as a service or a vendor. And Cameron is really a thought leader on um, operationalizing uh, data and how we bring and, and extract value out of this tremendous amount of information that sits within our companies and around us every day. I'm equally excited to have Melissa Swift with us. Melissa is the head of transformation for North America for Mercer. Melissa touches many different aspects, I think, of the subjects we're talking today. I mean, Mercer is a, a data-led, driven company, but really thinking about human-centric decisions based upon those things. And Melissa is, uh, uh, goes as far as say, one of the best in the industry, one of the most creative, and I think one of the most optimistic as she thinks about, uh, you know, where we are, but more importantly, where we can go. And one shameless plug for Melissa is that she has just finished writing a book. It's been a labor of love during the pandemic titled Work Here Now. I, I want to work here now. Sounds really exciting. And it's thinking like a human and building a human uh, or a powerhouse workplace, I believe is the title. So Melissa, I think that's coming out in just a month or so, but you can already, yeah, already purchase January. it. Awesome. Yeah, but you can pre-order now. So. so I actually, I did order my copy this morning. So it's, uh, um, it's, it's, I know how, how exciting these things can be and, and what a labor of love it's been as you've done it. But I imagine we'll hear some vignettes and caveats today as we unpack this. So with that, why don't we um, jump right in? I think we often highlight the negative impacts of deglobalization. We see the world kind of shaking and, and, and you know, we see what our, our country's leaders and politics and nationalism and populism and all this noise that's going on, war on multiple fronts and restructures of systems. Um, there will be winners and losers. I think that's clear as we think about countries and work and opportunity. But what we want to still stare into today is, is people. They're in the middle of all this and people drive 
purpose and people at the heart of the businesses that we're advising. So we want to get into what are we seeing. So Melissa, from Mercer's point of view, uh, transformation is what you do. You touch businesses globally, but with a real kind of North America sense. What are what are you seeing? What's what are the big trends? What are companies concerned or thinking about in the space? Yeah, so part of what's interesting, right, is this whole question of what does location mean is being rethought, right? So with an increasingly, you know, virtual, hybrid, remote uh, workforce, you know, that's that's one dimension of if we're in a location, do our people have to be in that location? You know, that fundamental tie has been cut a bit. Uh, then there's the question with, you know, ongoing labor shortages, labor crises, especially around some of these really critical roles, you know, think nurses in healthcare systems as, as a for instance. Um, you know, how can we solve for some of these issues differently? I think for a long time, there was kind of a, a race to sort of lowest cost of talent, lowest cost of talent, lowest cost of talent. And if you talk to some of our folks that do workforce analytics consulting today, they'll tell you that organizations are now saying, well, maybe it's highest skilled ecosystem instead of lowest cost of talent. And so some of that stuff's going on even before you get to the conversation about regionalization, there's just a fundamental rethink on what is a location and what do I need from it? And then as you start to think a bit more, and again, this is really occasioned by the labor crisis about how do I kind of create some resiliency? So, you know, let's say I'm, okay, it's great. I'm the only factory in town in a tiny town and I have low cost of labor. Well, oh my goodness, you know, big online retailer that starts with an A just built a warehouse in my tiny town. Oops. You get you have to really start to think about how to buffer some of those those labor shocks and you know we see companies making the decision differently it might be okay in one region I need a bunch of small offices I need a big you know location in one region, maybe I need to be really geographically diffused there's not a right answer to it, but we are seeing a real rethink on kind of these issues, you know around resiliency around labor supply and around thinking you know what a location even is. Melissa, along those lines, and uh, I don't know if this will be provocative or not, but if we think about and every day we wake up and we hear uh, troubled times economically, uh, you know, shifting sands and things in front of us, but high employment rates. We've actually seen, you know, employment, unemployment, not at these levels, gosh, in the last last 40 years. So the question you know, that somebody asks is, well, do we have the workforce to do more um, if we are maybe re-onshoring or bringing things back to the United States? Um, so the question is, is your point of view, high unemployment, but are people doing what they want to be doing? Is there, is there an opportunity for them to lift themselves into, into better, higher paying roles? What are you seeing across kind of those broader demographics? Yeah, so it's interesting because we're seeing what used to be really kind of well-segmented, um, let's say lower wage uh, job markets becoming kind of one big fluid market. And that's really challenging for employers. You know, it used to be, okay, I, again, I'm come back to our case study. I'm the only factory in this little town. Well, now my folks could be remote employees of a call center company, because guess mm -hmm. what? The, the skill set between being a factory worker and being a call center employee, maybe it's not, you know, for that percentage of workers that have the EQ or whatever, maybe the, there's more transferable skills than I ever thought between those jobs and location was the only barrier. So, you know, when you start to rethink those, those pieces, right, it, it, it gets very, and it, it's a strange time too, if you think about it, it's I've got, I'm thinking about cost cutting in my workforce, but I've also got dozens, if not hundreds of open recs at the same time. And, and putting that equation together and, you know, to your point, is there a potential for workers to do more quite possibly and we're seeing organizations make concrete moves to showcase career pathing so you know my local shake shack actually shows here's the path to manager it's displayed in the window you know that's a that's a total paradigm shift about you know if we want to keep our good workers and keep our institutional knowledge we will create paths up within our organization so they don't have to go somewhere else to grow oh, well said mm -hmm. thank you melissa mm -hmm. cameron just jumping over to you you tend to view everything from kind of the data lens first and mm -hmm. foremost, like Melissa and I maybe uh, start with the question and run to the data, um, but you're thinking about where is the data that it, it informs yeah. these things. What are you seeing in this space? Uh, what are some of the questions you're being asked by the, the teams you're advising? Um, well, I think I think exactly as Melissa's highlighted, the, there is a major trend to recognize the problem 
in talent acquisition, but also recognize that I think individuals now have a lot more opportunity of choice. And if you look at the different generations, they have different values and they have different requirements. So to answer those problems, I don't think it's particularly easy and data helps try and answer those problems. Um, so what, one aspect of it is, you know, what is, what is an organization's understanding of their workforce and what the candidate pool is for, you know, a relative function that they're really struggling to fill? And does it need to be done in the location they've always done it in? But to Melissa's point, that may, ne may no longer be a choice because if you do have sort of very low cost workforce that suddenly decides, well, actually, you know, I've got a much better job over in a call center than being a factory worker. So how do you identify, is that going to happen? And I think what you need to be doing is combining a much greater understanding of the data around what the candidate pools are at a regional level, a national level, and also a global level. Because if I look at some of the questions that over the years I've asked myself about where am I going to place my workforce? One of the big choices was which country am I going to create a data collection center? Is it going to be traditionally India? You know, that was, that was where everyone went. It was Mumbai or it was Delhi. And actually we went through a list of 10 different countries. And when you evaluated each of those countries, each had a complete variety of skill set that um, tended to veer either towards manufacturing or uh, much more service providers. But in actual fact, what we identified were there was a central core of individuals in each of those countries that were highly talented at what we needed to do. And then it came down to more the practicalities of how we could bring it all together. So, you know, what are the cultural differences? How do you set up an office? How do you actually get the data flowing within the organization? But if we hadn't actually pulled the data together in the first place and done an evaluation, we would never have known. Fast forward a decade, of course, the workforce now is quite used to being able to work remotely. The hybrid model is coming in. And therefore that I think makes it a lot harder to differentiate between how are you going to identify this as a potential problem? And I think the, the issue that Melissa's identified is one of probably the biggest problems we've got, that you've got someone who has to go to uh, you know, their place of work, because they've got no choice because it's um, very hands-on versus, oh, I don't need to go anymore. I can go and work at home. So how does an organization create um, that incentive plan to say, this is a great place to work? And that to me is a number of different things that organizations in terms of my clients are actively now looking at, particularly in the professional services arena, where it's becoming a big, big problem for hybrid working and the need to come into the office or not. So I think there's a long way to go. I think data is critical to this. And I think with all of these things, it's just going through that data and getting the right data points to create the visibility needed by the senior leadership team to go, we can make a viable strategic decision to combat this problem. And not doing it as a reactive exercise, but being proactive about it. Interesting. Well said, Cameron. I know that we as a business have really taken this skills-based approach to looking at all the data we have and trying mm. to map things here domestically and globally to advise on some of these strategic decisions. But it's interesting you mentioned the remote working world, because I think we're seeing similar impacts on kind of the physical working world. What do I mean by that? The makers, the builders, the yeah. folks who not yet have to show up every day. And uh, one of the case studies I love, and we as a business were not involved in this decision to be clear, but it's one that we were you know, really, I think, interested in as we think about this broader conversation was Samsung. Uh, you know, Samsung strategic decision probably six months ago was to invest $17 billion. Yes, that's $17 billion as one company in Texas to build a semiconductor manufacturing facility. And that's a two year build, maybe three. And that investment is looking into the future is going, okay, we know we need to get the supply chain into the US, it's gonna take time. And they looked at 
demographics, workforce dynamics, the type of skilled labor that they would need inside that facility. And that's very much where they made this massive, I mean, talking about infrastructure decision that was based upon in large part, human capital data, right? You know, they needed to know that they could show up there and not just get tax incentives to build and do the things the states love to do, exactly. but know that the yeah. workforce of, I think is 3000 people, uh, we're going to be able to, you know, move in to that facility in the next two years. So I think it's, it's quite fascinating where debt on one hand, to your point, is the driver of the remote world and also this thing that will remain, the physical <laughs> that word. That yeah, word. and I think, I think a really important point that you mentioned right at the beginning, actually, Kenan, is it is very, very easy to be swept up by the data revolution, if you like, to say, well, we're going to go through you know, all the data points and that is the answer. But at the end of the day, human beings are human beings, and you have to have the ability to analyze the data and have, I believe, an indicative path to take, but then apply the more subjective elements around what are actually people going to be incentivized by? You know, what's important to them as an individual that will make Samsung, in this instance, a company they want to go and work for? Because I think it's fair to say that the the latest generation that is now journey, joining the workforce are going to be very much looking at what does this company offer me from a, uh, a, a variety of different aspects. It's not just money. Oh, Melissa? I was just going to say the generational piece is interesting. I just wanted to pick up on that because we had some interesting findings from um every year we do and this year's results aren't out yet so i'll talk about last year's uh this inside employees minds research and one of the things that really struck me from last year's was that we had you know sort of uh we have methodology around unmet needs of employees and for everybody below 55 mental health was a top five unmet mm -hmm. need and then it falls out of the top five entirely and there's something a little bit scary about that, because if you think about who's CEOs and boards, right, a lot of them are in that 55 plus category. So they're sitting on the other side of a big divide in thinking and prioritization. And so that's why it's really important to kind of do that employee listening work with your workforce, because what you may intuitively see as a need may not be the needs, you know, be it generationally or by gender or by ethnic group or, or whatever. Our unmet needs work surfaced a lot of differences between populations. But that was the one that that really struck me is it was so top of mind, except for the group of people running organizations. Really interesting. So I'm going to take that opportunity to maybe break the jump the agenda a little bit and maybe jump to this uh, this question conversation around this talent cliff. I mean, that sounds frightening, that term unto itself. Maybe we need a better one, or maybe it should be frightening as we think about it. Uh, on one hand, we're seeing, gosh, the demography around the world uh, shift in a way that is quite scary as we think about reproduction and it's nothing we can we can fix overnight. You know, everybody says, well, how do governments fix this? And I think the answer is they can't. Um, you know, we, in certain countries are better positioned than others as we kind of think about the future. And one of the stats that uh, I read recently is in Japan, great nation has done some amazing things, but more diapers, more depends are sold than diapers uh, at this point in time. So you're mm -hmm. just seeing kind of this, this aging population. And I kind of use that for effect. It plays a little bit off of Melissa, I think, as we look at our own leadership and the workforce behind them. Um, so I guess the question kind of begins as we think about data. I think the U.S. is uniquely better off than many places, still not great when we think about demography and who's yeah, and where. Mm -hmm. um, what is Mercer seeing, Cameron? What are you seeing as we try and tackle the, 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 the skills talent cliff and then maybe it's the skills gap to get people uh, you know, forward? Um, well, I think, I think you make a really good point, Kenan. Um, and I think from certainly from the UK perspective, but also from um, uh, you know, my experiences in the US uh, over the last 12 months, this is a problem that more and more boards and um, executive teams are becoming increasingly worried about. And I think it's good because one of the things that they are all listening to are the elements of their own workforce saying, we don't have the level of satisfaction or comfort that we did have pre-pandemic. And so the next question is, what are they going to do about it? And that is a question that, funnily enough, I've been involved in 
a number of discussions with uh, CEOs, firm-wide leaders, uh, managing partners of professional services firms, all who have the same question. And to your point, Melissa, they are all probably over 45, 50, 55, and they are really, really struggling to try and identify how the younger workforce, you know, in the age range of 20 to 35, are actually thinking. So to me, this is, it's not a simple solution at all. But what we have to start doing is listening to people and making um, our employees feel comfortable with feeding back what they actually think. It, it's no good saying, well, uh, here's a survey, we'll take your survey and, you know, oh, by the way, put all your details in and um, we won't do anything nasty with it because human nature dictates that you will be slightly suspicious. Uh, what you need to do is get the trust of employees so that they feel, okay, I can contribute and I know that I will be listened to. And should I want to discuss it with a member of senior management, there is a path for me to do that. I spoke with a managing partner of a very successful accountancy practice in the UK who pride themselves on really focusing on the ESG um, agenda, uh, broadly speaking. But one of the aims was to ensure that their employees felt they had a complete forum to discuss this. And they ensured that every discussion had all of the different age ranges in that discussion forum so that the company and the leadership team could get a really clear sense from the data what they needed to do. Have they been successful? Well, I think the COO was, was very open that they certainly are more successful than others, but they also realized that it's still quite a big mountain to climb but they have done something about it. And I think that what I saw in this particular meeting was there were probably 10 other uh, CEOs and managing partners all nodding their heads saying, that's brilliant. I, I have a direction that I can now take. Fantastic. So I think it's, let's not, not, let, let's not think it's an easily solved problem, but let's take the first step and get that transparency going and really encourage our employees to start Talking. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add, you know, we did a piece of research recently that showed that everything else being held equal, that while age doesn't correlate one way or the other to employee performance, tenure does. So mm. there's, you know what I mean? There's a, there's a virtue to retaining the folks you have. And then when you kind of match that up with that natural demographic cliff, right, there's, there's some anxiety about losing that group of of older workers because there's there's a true performance benefit to their tenure. So some of the interesting strategies we're seeing organizations employ is, for instance, making that off ramp a softer one, right? So maybe it's just not I you know I hit 65, although 65 is a bit of a dream these days. Hit whatever age and and retire. It's okay. So then I you know I go half time. I coach. I mentor. And it's nice because it does hit some of the needs we're hearing articulated from the younger populations. Of I want presence. I want coaching. I want mentoring. I want real time feedback. You know. And and it's it can be hard within the construct of the business to get that from you know workers charging through their their forties and fifties. But maybe somebody in their sixties or seventies you know, can get involved and can be a better part of that, that equation. So I see that as a really constructive solution to some of these demographic issues. And again, providing greater degrees of flexibility really helps, you know, if they can, okay, move to a retirement community, you know, somewhere in the Southern part of the United States and continue to work remotely, right? That, that helps, you know, there's all sorts of ways to kind of make that happen and really continue to include that group in the workforce, because I think there's there's an acknowledgement that they have a huge amount to contribute. And again, it's moving away from that mentality of sort of strict, you know, everything's driven by costs and they're expensive and get them out the door, right? It's it's okay. It's about value, and that group has a huge amount of value. Well, well said, Melissa. And I think we're seeing it, um, you know, statistically and anecdotally at the really senior levels of not just the executive but also the subject matter expert space. And, you know, we've uh, had, had clients that have spoken to us about engineering talent, advanced engineering talent going, we don't have yet the muscle memory of the up and coming workforce or to, to do what we need. 
can we potentially go out into the retiree workforce and incent some of them to come back and almost to serve in that bridge capacity as you just described. So I think it's it's the C-suite and it's also it's it's subject matter expertise across these across these lanes and divides. So I think it's really, really interesting and potentially more opportunity based for everyone else. Because another piece of globalization, deglobalization is that people are living longer and we do have, you know, potentially more more benefit in a very commercial term to extract from you know, from a, a, a wiser uh, part of the workforce um, and and time to do it. So I think it's 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 a really interesting point. Um, just moving moving on to some other interesting topic. I know we've got some questions coming in. We want to definitely save some space to, to to hear from everyone and jump to it. But organizational structures, uh, and I know that we've seen a move over the last many years towards less centralized, hierarchical to more matrixed, uh, you know, uh, versions. Mercer, you're a wonderful example of a highly matrixed organization that is global, right? So, <laughs> um, but as we see the world, if, uh, you know, regionalize or whatever terms we want to use a bit, are you seeing clients move faster towards a more localized model of leadership, less command and control, or what's, what's, what's happening in your points of view, Melissa? I would say it, it, we're seeing a really healthy conversation around centralization that, you know, on the one hand, yes, if you had geography as a dimension of your matrix, that got really weird when your workers just moved everywhere, right? So that's, that's a confusing aspect. But more than that, I think there's a healthy conversation about what actually needs to be centralized and what goes well centralized and what just doesn't. And in certain mm -hmm. functions, you feel a lot of push pull within the HR function as a, for instance, you know, there was a huge move towards centralization and shared services and, and, you know, really thinking about a lot of these things in a joined up way. And when you talk to our HR transformation experts, they'll, they'll tell you that was, that was the right move. But then you get this tension of how do I reconcile centralized agenda from central HR and everything that continues to bubble up through the BPs, through the business, right? And that sort of top down, bottom up conversation, every function in the organization has a version of that, you know, less so in finance, probably more so in IT, right? With all the shadow IT, things like that. And so it's, it's when you then add the geographical layer, it gets, it gets I think really complex, but the kind of key thing is to look at what are your actual drivers of a business value, right? Not what feels good. Sometimes it feels good to centralize or decentralize things and it's not connected to business value. And this is a big theme I talk about a lot in my book is that we have kind of some of these beliefs about how work should get done. And we've got to sort of stop for a second and say, okay, what is the real thread? connecting how we do the work to the value generated. And I think centralization is a great one to, to do that around because it hits so many of our kind of emotive things about either, you know, I want to just be able to tell everyone how to do it or I don't want to be told. And you have to kind of take the emotion out and say, what's going to really work for the business? Mm -hmm. Cameron? Yeah, I mean, it's very interesting. Having, having experienced both myself and also being in the fortunate position of then advising clients on this very fact. Um, I have mixed views on it. I think that you can see centralization as a wonderful means of helping large organizations really drive through efficiencies. But I think there is always a great danger that in driving through those efficiencies, just to Melissa's point, that actually you start to have the flexibility and that dynamic nature of the smaller regions of that organization feeling stifled and then they're, they're not able to react to situations that that may be very very topical in that region but not so topical from a global standpoint so i view it like this um i think that centralization that there should there is always a need for it and that there is always a need to look at it with a how do we bring economies of scale to an organization effectively but how can we also not be watching over every part of the organization to make sure that they're hearing to the standards 100 percent how do you do that well i think it's quite simple actually it's like if you're building a car and you build your standard um you know volkswagen golf then you know that at the top of the range it's very expensive and you can add lots of different parts to that volkswagen golf but at the box standard model you've got all the component car parts that make it a car so if you apply the same to say a technology or an HR function, which I appreciate is quite simplistic, but 
um, they're both highly complex areas, you can start off with having very common areas that apply across the world. That you know, they're the standard things that you know you need to do. So technology, it might be security. We all know that we have to have antivirus software on our laptops. Um, so that would be point number one, but we don't necessarily dictate to the technology teams around the world, you must use exactly it in this way to do this part of the process. So in summary, it comes down to clear guidelines that are highly visible and transparent throughout the organization with enough adaptability and flexibility that regions can adapt to the local circumstance, in my view. I think driven by um, by by data uh, at a regional or local level, and uh, of course, yeah. And it's I wish I wish that we had planned this because it's actually it it, it has, it's just turning out quite well. But the, the case study I was just going to mention here that I think is really interesting. You mentioned VW, is I would encourage everyone listening to to, to Google VW's decision to spin out a company called Scout. Scout is an iconic U.S. brand. International Scout, I think, existed in the, the 70s before they, that business um, stopped producing these trucks. But they, they made a, a German, uh, very structured, uh, hierarchical, well-run company made a decision to spin out a unique brand um, run by its own leadership team, almost with VW as an investor, leveraging some of their tools and resources to stand up, but to build a brand new car company. And they did that. Because at least as I understand, reading the news and, uh, and following the decisions is their analysis of the market, the data, the supply chain, the resources was to make that a uniquely American product designed for a certain set of customers built in a certain way with the supply chain fully integrated um, you know, in the United States. And also to be able to take advantage of unique tax incentives and other things that they wouldn't be able to do if, uh, if, if, they, were, if they were not a standalone entity. So I I've continue to see other uh examples like that over the last couple of years which are really i think novel for traditional companies that have done things a very certain way but to melissa and cameron's point have kind of made these really interesting decisions to adapt to market realities and people realities and 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 move forward so i just uh, i would, would encourage folks to, to to google that one as uh, maybe an example and, um, and cameron thanks for mentioning vw i had expected to connect those dots so coherently but uh before jumping to upskilling and retraining, uh, Melissa, Cameron, anything else you just want to add to this this uh, this piece of the conversation? Not for me, no. Awesome. Um, this is maybe what I personally think is maybe one of the most opportunity laced, exciting parts of regionalization, or whatever we want to describe it. There will be, I think, some winners outside of the U.S. in certain markets. We often read about Vietnam, Malaysia, Thailand will be the beneficiaries of, of some decisions to leave markets like China. We'll see similar instances in places like Europe. But as we all sit here in America and in the U.K., kind of really connected economies, um, I think there's a real chance to think about some of these forces at play that allow us to engage parts of the workforce that have historically been been marginalized or left out or not given mm -hmm. some of the opportunities and and I think that's, you know, maybe a, maybe a challenge to everyone on this call and all of us to really think deeply about is, is where can we impact this space? Melissa, I'd just like to uh, maybe start yeah. to use, what do you see in there? What's interesting? What's happening? Uh, yeah, this is a big topic of passion for me. And this is something I talk a bunch about in my book. So, you know, if you think about it, there's, we're, we're sitting here in a, in a labor crisis, right? We don't have enough people. We don't have enough people. We have tons of people. We just don't have the usual people. So some of those populations that are really great for organizations to think about and that we're seeing you know, better targeted, you know, number one, we're seeing a lot of organizations pull the college degree requirement out of their job descriptions. And so this is something, you know, so Amazon is doing this, taking people out of high school and teaching them to code, pretty straightforward. But a lot of organizations are saying top to bottom, none of our job descriptions should have that in there. I mean, 60% of job descriptions in the United States today have a college degree requirement and that's it's 60 percent of jobs don't actually require that level of that exact training it, it doesn't actually make sense and it really skews the demographics right you end up with a much more homogeneous group you're drawing from from just that one bullet in the job description so non-college educated folks are, are one population i think formerly incarcerated folks that's another really underutilized population i mean the unemployment rate for that group is something like 27 percent and there's some great multi-decade, very successful case studies at places like Johns Hopkins, where they've been hiring formerly incarcerated people for years with zero incidents, same performance, and higher retention 
than their overall employee population, right? So hugely successful. More recently, you've seen Hilton is starting to hire those workers, JP Morgan. And interestingly, with legal change, so, you know, for instance, in New York State, the laws around marijuana have changed. So you have formerly incarcerated people where what they did is not a crime anymore, even, right? So you have the, these populations that are sort of not attended to, and you have to do things, by the way, differently if you want to hire folks without a college degree, formerly incarcerated people, people who are highly trained, but not necessarily English speakers, right? That's another great mm -hmm. population um, to target where the, the only training they need is English language training, and they've got all the skills to do the work. Something like 16% of the workforce in the United States is foreign born, and we don't do enough to kind of take in and, and support that population. So there's all these kind of groups just hiding in plain sight. And then what you have to do is a change your lens on talents to make sure that you're not formally blocking folks from applying and that also your talent acquisition process supports them applying, which is a different thing than just not excluding them. Uh, and then you have to change your view on what training and upskilling means, right? That it might be a coding boot camp, it might be an English language boot camp, it might be how to navigate a modern, you know, flat structure organization when you spent the last 10 years in a highly hierarchical prison, right? There's all kinds of different ways that we can reskill and upskill people. And the more creative you get, basically, the more great workers you get access to. Well said, Melissa. Uh, Cameron, you know, I guess when I think about data, there's a piece to this, which is a challenge is where do we find even the right information around some of these historically marginalized groups or folks that there's an opportunity to upskill because there's, um, they're not all on LinkedIn, like the, the three mm -hmm. of us are in the same way. Uh, and yet we want to make sure, of course, we're protecting the information that's out there. But are you seeing uh, businesses lean into this space and say, hey, Cameron, where do we go to find this talent pool? Uh, I am actually, yes. It's it, increasingly, it's where can we find data um, across the board on a number of different subjects. What one is, of course, talent acquisition, and it's um, principally around trying to get a better transparency around the candidate pool and gain a deep understanding of just how we create that list of candidates that could be eligible. Uh, because I think, you know, Melissa makes a great point. The traditional methods of creating that long list of candidates that your starting point is where you must have a degree um, or you must have a particular set of qualifications, I think misses out a huge number of individuals. And so the starting point for me is always, well, have you looked at your own organization to start off with? Um, but then if you haven't, have you looked at the network that can be engendered from your organization? So it's actually asking people within the organization, well, do you know someone? that could fill this job. And I think it goes a little way to identifying those people who may not necessarily be in LinkedIn, but it doesn't solve the problem. So therefore it's actually starting to look at how do you identify data sources that may be a little bit more niche, that are specializing in capturing data around individuals. And, and they can be everyone from former members of the armed forces, um, people that may have a criminal record, people that have actually uh, retired and have decided they don't want to work. So one of, the big, one of the big things we have in the UK right now is health professionals that have, for whatever reason, left the profession. And the data to get those individuals back again is not as clear as one would think because they may not want to be coming back to the profession. So it's how do you find people that uh, need to have something that's going to incentivize them to come back, but at the same time, you, you've got to find them first. So I look at various areas that you can do this. Um, the first is, you know, regulatory bodies, any form of trade body that individuals like this might be in. Um, and that's very easy to say, but you can have people that are um, incredibly talented, say in the construction industry, that manage, you know, million, tens of million dollar construction projects. They won't be on LinkedIn, but they are amazing at managing highly critical, highly stressful situations. Well, how do you find them? Well, there are a number of bodies out there 
where they probably are you know members it could be a union or it could be something similar so i think you you know you have to be flexible i think you have to think outside the box there is no right answer to this but you you can't just narrow the focus and say let's go to the traditional areas for data you have to look almost everywhere you can quite frankly uh, Cameron, I think it's what compelled us, the business, to kind of get into the big data business, for lack of a better term, yeah, exactly. is, to, is to try and isolate and 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 um, illuminate you know, some of these some of these skill sets if you can. And and I, I know there's a. I just want to make sure they're answering a question that maybe going through some folks' head is, you know, how is this an executive search firm's um, area of interest? Well, I think everything we're talking about here is it's your C-suite challenges at the highest mm -hmm. level. The individuals Absolutely. we're being asked to place. Are the same ones that are thinking about solving for these these uh, these critical uh, these critical questions. So I think we've just found ourselves is you know we need to make sure that we're part of that solution and, and broader than just putting a, a a leader in a seat, but helping kind of really think through the broader human capital um, uh, opportunities that are laced with it. But mm -hmm. the other group I just throw out there is is I think you mentioned veterans. Um, you know we've never had. Um, probably since World War II, I don't think we've had as many, uh, you know, and at least our country, the UK is probably quite similar as we think about some of our allies and others that have been at war for so long. Uh, you know, the, 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 the folks with high school degrees, but yet amazing capabilities that sit in it. But it's a really interesting challenge. And Melissa, I, I, I'm certainly going to take it away is how do we as a collective and everyone on this call think about it? And we maybe have an obligation here is to, is to think about upskilling and reskilling in, in, a, in a more dynamic way than we have mm -hmm. Than we have historically, because I may go so far as to think about it, it's one of the ways we potentially really solve for the equity piece of of D and I, which we've talked so often about, and I'm regularly, um, you know, just find myself scratching my head for solutions when I hear about the equity piece really being the hardest part of mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. But as I'm listening right now, it's it's there there is some really tangible action steps to you know to to solve for it based on some of these global dynamics of the world we're in. So I think it's it's a, it's an inspiring point for me. Absolutely, and I think sometimes you know equity means questioning your assumptions. So I'll give an example of something that that sometimes blocks people's entrance into the the workforce is that certain hiring softwares look for resume gaps. Right. So I changed jobs around the time my daughter was born and I took time off until she was seven months old. I'm unhirable by those systems. I have a resume gap. Right. And, you know, I work for a reputable professional services firm. I got a book coming out. I wouldn't say I'm categorically unhirable, but think about how many companies in the world, their systems would just bounce me right out. And I that's a really where... good point. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I think it's a really good point that the great danger of AI solutions that are trained to spot for inconsistencies, that they also need to be trained to identify that there may be a good reason why there's a gap. And, and I think that um, that at this moment in time requires a kind of a human element to it because that can be interpreted. But until such time as that human element can be removed, you have to have it. Um, and it's not going to, um, solve the problem otherwise. I think it drives to the, you know, the, the, the demand and need for, you know, humans in the loop, right? Where as much as technology is bringing us forward and AI yep. is making mm. these huge leaps and it maybe gets the upskilling and reskilling question as well is going to be these tech enabled jobs, uh, as opposed to, you know, uh, machines you know, being a thing that really lead us into the future, they'll help us. But, uh, it really isolates Melissa, I think, you know, how much, you know, uh, people, and then human-centric kind of mindset uh, is, is remains important. So I know we've got uh, just about a quarter of the hour left. I've had some questions that are rolling in. So if it's all right with you, Melissa Cameron, mm -hmm. I'm gonna jump into a couple of these. Right. I'm gonna start with the most recent that came in first. Um, question is, why are so many employees so unhappy? Uh, you know, so much transformation, so many things happening. I hear there's opportunity, uh, yet folks are unhappy and they're leaving and many of them without new roles. Uh, Melissa, I'm gonna, I'm going to serve this over to you because I think you write about it, you think about it. What, I, uh... do. I do. I think what honestly what happened during COVID was that we had many decades of work changing for the worse, right? So work got 
more intensified. And, and intensification of work could mean I have too many Zoom calls in a day, or I have to pick too many strawberries in an hour, right? But there's great, tons of great academic research that everybody's job, not just during COVID, but for decades has gotten more and more intensified. Uh, and I think that, you know, that feeling built up during the COVID period, and then, you know, we, we hit a breaking point. And once we hit a breaking point where we start to question you know, what am I working for? So it's interesting. A lot of times it manifests itself as a discussion on pay, you know, of I should be paid more. Well, where that feeling from workers is coming from, if I should be paid more, is the realization within an hour of work, I'm actually doing more. And that's where some of the transformational elements, like the introduction of more technology, et cetera, et cetera, the introduction of more technology didn't necessarily make our jobs easier. Uh, this is There's a whole chapter on this uh, in, in my book about, the human experience of technology at work can be pretty crummy and it, it can make work worse. And again, during COVID, we were sort of more exposed to just dealing with technology all day long. And so that's where kind of some of this lingering and even building sentiment about, you know, I just, I, I've, I can't take it anymore is, is coming from is that, again, things were allowed to get quietly worse. Greedy work got worse over the last 30 or 40 years, right? Where work, especially for white collar knowledge workers and some of the best compensated roles started to spill out of the edges of the workday, right? That you're taking calls during your kid's breakfast and your family's dinner and at night. And the greedy work got worse too, in addition to work intensification. So you have these very long-term observable trends of work becoming less appealing. And I think we just hit a point where people realized it. And now that people have realized it, it you can't unsee it. You know, I, I talk in my book about a, a moment of during COVID where I was like on a Zoom call trying to like make some fried rice for lunch for the family. And I had this moment of, oh, what am I even doing? Why is, why is this even happening? Why am I on video with these people? Why can't I just have 10 minutes to fry rice? You know, you have a few of those and, and you don't really walk back from it. And that's, I think, the trend that we're seeing across the, the workforce. And that's where the organizations that are gonna come out of this really successful are the ones that re-engineer how work gets done to make it satisfying to their employees. And by the way, that's what helps productivity too, right? It's not like you have to take an economic loss. Do this right, employer and employee alike win. Well said, Melissa. Cameron, if you want to add Yeah, I think, I think for me, there's just one statement that, that encapsulates everything, which is the pandemic made a lot of the working population reevaluate their work-life balance and uh, look long and hard at the fact that suddenly the expectation of doing 12 hours of Zoom calls back to back became acceptable without realizing, of course, that they probably were doing eight hours, nine hours of that during the day, maybe even 12 hours physically and taking calls in the evening. So I think suddenly you were in this environment where everyone is going, well, to Melissa's point, you don't have time to go and cook lunch because your secretary or executive assistant's just gone and booked you out for 13 hours. And in my case, it would be, um, oh, I've got a call with um, Asia and then I've got one with the West Coast. Oh, fantastic, oh, happy days. Um, you know, so you stretch the day out and people start to go, well, why do I want to do that? And an interesting uh, fact that, and I don't know how this plays out across all of the sectors and industries, but if we just take financial services, for example, I think many people are questioning, well, I know that you can make a lot of money, but is money now enough? You know, and there will be a segment of the working population go, yeah, absolutely, great. Nothing wrong with that. But there's a segment of the population is going, but well, actually, no, I'm going to put my family first or I'm going to put my balance of work life first. How am I going to do that? So I think to Melissa's point, companies need to pull together the data. And one of the interesting aspects for me here is how can you use technology to make your employees' lives easier? Not to create a sense of fear because they're going to have their jobs replaced by a technological, a technical solution, but it's great. It's a new solution that's come in that will make my life more easier and more productive. And that's the selling point. If you use AI as an example, AI is only as good as the questions you ask it. 
and train it to do. It is no good saying we're going to put AI in and hope for the best because it is not a silver bullet. But if you do it right, and the companies that do, they will be able to use technology and data that comes out of it very, very successfully. Well said. The only thing I'd, I'd add is, is I, I think it's an overarching lack or quest for purpose. And, and I think how companies engage that and think about what purpose means to their people and reminding folks what their own corporate purpose is, I think is a way that we hopefully move forward in addressing it. I mean, we're going back to the globalization, deglobalization piece of this. We're blessed to live in a more, in many ways, safe, secure, um, and an abundant world than the world than anyone in the world, of course, human history has ever lived in. Yet we have these huge gaps uh, that we see. We have, you know, depression at all-time highs, mental health, and 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 concerns, and drug addiction, and all of these other things. So, how can we, again, as companies in our right space and place, address some of that? And I think the the purpose piece and everything, Melissa, you said, and uh, and we can give people a chance to perform really highly in their in their roles, but do so in a way enabled to your point, Cameron with technology to do some of the other things that really drive them, uh, whether that's coaching, whether that's being a parent, whether that's mm. whatever it may be, we've got more tools at our disposal to have a, a well-rounded life than maybe ever before. So how do we, how do we bring that to bear? Um, another question here as we're, um, and apologies to everyone if we're not able to get to all of these, but we'll certainly try. I'll share them with Melissa and Cameron afterwards. So if we can send some responses afterwards, we certainly will. Um, this is an interesting one, uh, you know. Uh, it's a it's a broad statement, so I think you know I'm, I'm, it's a you know in this person's estimation, companies believe the workforce is thinking that uh, it'll become more compliant as a recession occurs, meaning you know there'll be less choice, less opportunity. Uh, what this question person is asking it seems the demographics do not support this, right? So companies believe one thing, the demographics may say another. Um, the only thing I would start with, I think if companies are really viewing things that way, I'd probably say beware, <laughs> but uh, but I'm sure Melissa has some other things to add is what are you seeing in that space? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I think fundamentally, this is a question and Ken, you're, you're sort of alluding to this, that companies need to fundamentally reset on that, you know, the foundation that in, in some of the research from my book, it, it really became apparent that human resources as a function was created to basically suppress violent clash between labor and management around the, the turn of the last century. So, you know, that mentality has persisted of thinking about this in terms of a power dynamic with the employer firm, firmly in control. And from everything we know about human psychology today, that's, that's not a productive way of looking at the world. Right. It, again, like, let's move from an I win, you lose to an everybody wins world of sustainable work. And, and I think that's part of what we're seeing show up is that it, it wasn't going to be this sort of thing where employees, there was a labor crisis and employees had all this magical power. And then the magical power was going to disappear the second there was a recession. I mean, that's that's not the reality. The reality is there have been these structural changes around everything from the way employees look at the world to again, the very structure of labor markets becoming more fluid. And then those are not reversible changes, but fundamentally we, you know, we have to stop looking at it with a power dynamics lens because not, not because it's wrong, which it is wrong, but it's unhelpful and it's not good business to look at it that way. And I think when we look at creating the wins you know, for both groups, that's where we start to break through some of those long time kind of productivity barriers of why do we spend all this money in technology and not get more productive? Well. If we looked at it with a win-win view, that's where we get the productivity step change. Something mm. that's really interesting, and maybe just to for everything I think we're talking about is with a commercial view, right? All of this is about how to optimize companies to do better. I think it can oftentimes get you know, well, we're just trying to placate a workforce, or um, you know, or the or, the, or the, the people's revolution that now folks are responding to. No, it's really about. I think it's your point. How do we build? A powerhouse workforce to use the title of your book, right? It's doing these things to optimize your performance <laughs> as we as we go forward. So mm -hmm. I think it sometimes gets lost. But uh, there's one other question. And I think it came and it touches to you from a data point of view. So I just want to make sure we get to it. Mm -hmm. Is is are there any metrics that you've seen that assess any correlation with remote working or the rise in remote working to individuals' willingness to move from company to company? Has is there a lack of stickiness? I think is really the question because of this remote work environment. Um, or loss of loyalty? What have, what have you seen? Or is there not enough data yet? So I think that there, 
from what I have seen, um, there's definitely the, the data is growing on this. Um, and I think that interestingly, I've had some very real examples of views being challenged around what the social mobility of the workforce is and also you know how prepared people are to work remotely um, in different parts of the US. So I think there was always a preconception, well, if you're on the East Coast or in the West Coast, then that's kind of where you, you might base yourself and that's where your company is going to be. And you know, you, you might not necessarily feel that comfortable with suddenly working for an East Coast company if you're based in, say, Sacramento in California. Um, I think that's gone completely out of the window now. And I think that um, how that's being reflected is if you look at, and I can only really talk about sort of the technology um, resources that I see at the moment, the, the the average salaries for technology resources seems to have normalized across the states a lot more than it than it was uh, historically and that tells me that people are now staying where they live but they are working for companies increasingly that are in completely different locations and there may be satellite offices so that's where the data is starting to be collected because you know you start to get um organizations like LinkedIn that are breaking down. Um, how many employees do you actually have based in California or in Texas or in New York? And if you happen to have just one office in say Chicago, well, that's a very interesting statistic because that company's successfully brought together a remote workforce. Um, what I haven't seen, and I would love to know if there is a universal data set out there other than, you know, organizations like LinkedIn is uh, a data set that is actually monitoring how people are using um, remote working. Are they coming into the office? You know, how extensive is the hybrid working? And in one case, one of my clients actively encourages once a month, all the team fly um, to uh, the headquarters of the organization to meet up because they quite rightly feel it's incredibly important that there's that face-to-face -face contact. They are doing it based on sort of um, the interaction and collaboration they see in the teams, which is data-based and it's quite rudimentary in terms of what you're talking about, Kenan, in terms of the question. But for me, this is critical. We have to have more data on this. And if LinkedIn is setting the, you know, the first step here to drive that forward, fantastic but I haven't seen a single data source yet that is monitoring it. And I would love to, quite frankly. Melissa, 45 seconds. <laughs> yeah, I can just say from one, um, from one of our large scale survey efforts, we did not see a meaningful difference in commitment among remote versus non-remote employees, which I, I think is, is very, very interesting. I mean, that's, that's one data point from one survey, but um, you know, there's, there's something fascinating there. And I think this is one of those ones where we got, we got to watch it to your point. We don't have a complete data set and we don't have a long-term data set. Mm, you know, exactly. How people feel right now versus how they feel in six months might be completely different. So, you know, 10 years from now, we're going to have some great data on this front, but I don't think we do yet. Mm. Thank you. Thank you both. I know we've just got a few seconds here. I want to stick to time is. Thank you to everyone who, uh, who joined us today. I hope the conversation was one that added some value, probably posed uh, or, or resulted more questions than answers, which was, I think, the point. And again, I'd like to just uh, encourage folks to pick up a copy of Melissa's new book. And, uh, and I really do hope we'll continue this conversation maybe around the subject, subject matters of her book and as we enter into the new year. So let us know if this is a value. We're happy to jump offline and, and go deeper on any aspects of it. Um, but thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Mercer, Cameron. Thank you. And, and, uh, and I really appreciate everyone's time. Have a wonderful day. Great. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Kenan. Thanks. Thanks, Kenan. Bye-bye.